Okay, uh, we've reached the point of the council meeting where we're at the council initiated discussion phase. And I think you've all been there and done that. I don't need to provide you any instructions. So if you've been saving up a message to deliver, now is the time. We're all ears. start planting ideas among the council members. Is there, um, is there an area you would like to hear a report from us? Yeah, I'm sorry, for September council. We'll have plenty to talk about. We'll be bringing the sequencing uh, grants to you, but... Before you said that, I think it would be an outstanding time. We need to continue the conversation from this morning. I mean, to, to think we wrapped up and had a closure this morning is, but, but it, I think it's an extremely important conversation. I don't know how we can pick up momentum or how we can give it structure, but I'd like to see us continue that discussion. Eric, which topic are you thinking of when you say the conversation this morning? So I'm trying just to get the conversation going here a little bit. It's interesting that that topic came up because two weeks ago at a staff meeting, three weeks ago at a staff meeting, Eric said, well, the five-year plan is about, the strategic plan is about five years old at this point. And internally, we're organizing a little retreat. It's purely internal. It's only four hours, but it's basically to look at the strategic plan and ask, is it still serving us well? Uh, are there technologies that are going to overrun it? Um, how are we positioned? And maybe something will come out of that that will start this conversation going. We need to think of a way to engage you in this process rather than just throwing something at you in September and have you say, no, it's not, not, not really what we had in mind. So let, let us think about how to do that. But, but Rudy, I think, I think what I'm hearing is slightly uh, it's overlapping, but it's not the same. So I think if I'm hearing right, I mean, one, one our exercise we're going to do internally is just sort of how vibrant, how fresh is the strategic plan for the field of genomics? From our earlier discussion, I think there's some questions around um, priorities, vision, what, what's the identity of NHGRI within that very broad landscape. And I think more specifically what you're talking about, Eric, is, you know, how do we want, when we go to implement that vision, how much of this do we want to have the investigator initiated versus crafted around top-down managed RFA-driven um, big projects? I mean, all of that. All that, but it's especially on the implementation side more than the big opportunity side. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Sure. All right. All right. And maybe, you know, just to um, uh, sort of <clears throat> continue with uh, a theme, I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, some earlier conversation in the day when the question was raised, you know, what would be, what's the one thing you'd most like to do? I might almost flip that around and say, um, when we think about NHGRI having many programs ongoing at present, um, uh, what is the process by which programs get sunsetted? Um, in other words, uh, and, and they might be sunsetted because of wild success or because of um, clear failure. <laughs> um, actually, the wild successes are the ones that are perhaps the most interesting. To think about, um, you know, what are the what are the what are the endeavors that NHGRI has uh, set in motion that have acquired their own momentum and their and their own uh, sources of success outside. NHGRI's budget or purview, and it would be very interesting, I think, to hear uh, even a short list of those things that um, are clearly succeeding so well that it's time to let them go free.
I, I suspect that will end up being an interactive discussion, which is what this group should be helpful in, in helping us think through. Other thoughts? So, so I actually found this uh, I guess exercise that Mike and Jeff made us go through for the for the webinars to be very useful of you know kind of we had a discussion I think a, a number of things were heard and then everyone had to go back and, and and quantify their priorities right and and rank and you only had so many check marks and, and you had to use them wisely and I, I think at least from some of the emails that followed that the results were were surprising relative to the the conversation that was had um, I don't know, I guess I'm just kind of wondering if, if you guys ever as a staff quantitatively try to actually put things on top or on bottom uh, and whether that would be a useful exercise in a non-subjective way but in, a, in, in a way you're forced to make decisions Not in a quantitative way. I think one of the wildly uh, successful things is certainly as uh, stating the obvious has been the sequencing. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we deal with uh, at a uh, at a clinical level moving whole exome sequencing from research into clinical where where it's actually paid for by uh, fee-for-service and uh, so I think that's one of the areas I, I was uh, I like the discussion with uh, Gail and uh, Les because it did that does start moving uh, some of that uh, sequencing technology into actually patient care and when we can start start offloading some of that from research costs into medical care costs so I think that needs to be part of the conversation at any rate and and we should probably deal with uh, uh, at least moving towards uh, uh, scaling down some sequencing efforts so I think that you know we all really like the heat map and we like the idea that <coughs> genomics will permeate the rest of medicine towards the right end of that, that spectrum I, I think a really hard thing that NHGRI is going to have to figure out and it, it really kind of meshes with what Val says um, is how much do we see how do we see our role as an institute in promoting, enabling, and evaluating that permeation? And what I'm getting at is it's going to be expensive. Uh, I mean, when you start doing clinical um, studies that involve lots of patients and looking at things like outcomes, which is important, right? I mean, somebody needs to do it. I don't know whether an HGRI needs to do it, but, but if you're going to start looking at at real outcomes, patient outcomes, and does genome sequencing improve outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's expensive, right? So it's only going to magnify all of the struggles and the tensions that we have had over the past few years that I've been on council. Um, and I think it was a perfect formulation, articulation of our vision five years ago to say we want to see that heat map move over to the right. But, but I think NHGRI is now going to have to kind of struggle with how much we want to pay for that. And will it get done without us? Right? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm, I'm, it distresses me in medicine to see all the things that get embraced. And then only way later do you find out that you, you did a bunch of stuff that didn't improve outcomes. Um, and it does seem on the surface of it to me a, a reasonable goal for an HGRI to be involved in that. 
but it's going to exacerbate the budgetary tensions because it's expensive. I would second that, Jim, but I would also say it's not only expensive, it takes patience and time. Like these things are not going to be short term, three year expensive. things, right? I right. mean, this is going to be, have to be a long term investment if, if we want to take that seriously. <laughs> and, and the one thing I would add, and this is something that I, I really do think there's a, uh, there's potential for to help mitigate some of that budgetary tension. And that is that we're experts in genomics. We're not experts in outcomes, by and large. There are uh, experts in those kinds of things in the NIH. So it does seem to me that judicious partnerships um, could make a lot of sense in that realm. Just finishing off that thought, I mean, I think I agree with the, the idea of thinking about if we don't do it, will somebody else do it? On the other hand, if it's not done, what are, what are going to be the implications of that? I mean, I think, um, you know, there was a lot of thought put into let's do this in a controlled way that can be studied. Um, and we've sort of started to go down that path. Um, and it's, it certainly hasn't, it, you know, it's a long path to go down. So anyways, and if it's not done, then what's going to happen is haphazard adoption that's not evidence-based. And I promise I'll shut up now after this. I, it does scare me when I see comments about pushing things into medicine, right? What we need to do is not so much push genomics into medicine. We need to really demonstrate where it's valuable. I think we've begun to do that, but, but the, the last legs of doing that are very expensive. Um, it's just that I don't want to see NHGRI being a snake oil institute that says, we've got the answer to everything. We want to push it into, into medicine. Yeah, I, I think at least for what insurance pay, insurance companies are paying for sequencing and hospitals are phenotyping you know, to the extent um, that they are caring for patients, that data could be very valuable to the institute. But I don't see that it has been um, a concerted effort in using that data in a more um, systematic manner. And it might not be as expensive since it's being paid for by others, but the analysis and the storage and, and the... Yeah, it's not really... I mean, it, we're having a hard time convincing third-party payers, I, mean, I think very legitimately, to, mm -hmm. to pay for the things we kind of want to do. So I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to offload much of the cost. Of it. Well, but if it, let's assume some places already have that in place, and some do for very limited gene sets and so on. So why is that not being more used or, or at least systematically uh, pulled together? I'd have to see what kind of what constructs you're talking about, you know, who, mm -hmm. right, where that's being paid. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, following up on Les's point and Jim's point here, I mean, there's no question that discovery, um, you know, it's going to be sequence first, ask questions later. I mean, that's basically what Les said uh, more eloquently than that. Um, is and I, and I do think that as we look at some of the challenges that are coming, we are going to have a tremendous number of variation. And the variation discovery then could be on a basic science, how we've always done it. But the other side to think about is, is how do you do variation validation at the speed of the clinic? Um, and I think that's something that, that you know, how do you preposition basic research uh, to be ready to move? Uh, and to me, that's maybe something that, that could be done by this institute, which is about scale, it's about throughput, it's about speed, because um, I think that's going to be a major bottleneck. I think we're going to have a huge number of variation, a huge number of thoughts about this, and then a gigantic gap between how do we prove that. Yeah, that, that's really true. I mean, one could split the clinical stuff into two things. One would continue to be discovery and phenotypic analysis and everything. Um, the other, I don't know who would do it. It does seem important, but it, it's also expensive, is, is figuring out, you know, really outcome-based research. Right? They're, they're two very different things, right?
So I assume, I mean, to some extent, you know, the precision medicine initiative might fill some of these roles, right? Yeah, I just so, worry that, you know, so many people want to get their, their claws into precision that pot, medicine. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I don't know if that's going to be the answer to all our problems. I just want to respond to Jim's comment on who's going to do it. I think we should do it. You know, I think, you know, to let the comparative effectiveness slash outcomes to sort of happen naturally, I think, is a mistake. I, mean, I agree a, completely. I mean, with the Affordable Care Act, these conversations are going on with many, many technologies. And, and I think there, we need to form the right partners, both with experts in the field and also probably with commercial clinical labs. Um, and, and begin to design these very long-term experiments that was, were just mentioned, both the economics yeah. of it, the clinical aspects of it, and the social aspects. And I, it's an ideal I time to begin agree. that conversation. It's, yeah. I completely agree. It is the one thing I was just trying to bring up is it is going to be expensive to do that, right? Where it, it depending, you know, I was interested in the budgetary figures this morning. It's hard to get a handle on how much of NHGRI's budget is being put into that, you know, categories four and five, right? Because the one measure deflates it, the other measure inflates it. I think Terry said around 27, 27 million, right? Um, it's it's going to be, you know, we're going to need to put more into that if, if we want to really do those things. But I agree with what you say, Eric, <laughs> completely. Um, leaving it to be done by others isn't a real good option when the genome is kind of our baby. And I don't think we can leave it to private industry. They have no interest in figuring those questions out. Right, but I think if we can, if we can define what it is, and also if we can form the right partnerships, I'm convinced we can control costs uh, quite a bit, as opposed to thinking we're going to bankroll the whole thing which, frankly, I just don't think we can afford over time. So. I could go back to one of the comments that Val made, I mean, in terms of setting up a, a discussion about some of these things. I mean, the fall will bring us some very uh, focused conversations along these lines. On the one hand, we'll be bringing to this council the reviews from many components of the genome sequencing program. Um, and we'll have to get, you know, your assessment of those reviews, and that will help probably calibrate the amount of resources we put into it. We have a penciled-in amount, but we don't even know if we'll have budget for that or we'll have too much, so we don't know, so that will help um, influence that. At the same time, in the fall, relevant to the conversation, the presentation we had earlier, I don't know when it is, I think September, Lucy, is a, is a workshop. What is it? September 28th is a workshop, critical workshop, that will uh, look at our clinic, our CSER program. Um, in a strategic way, um, and, um, and stimulate a discussion about its future, because if you recall th that it was, off, it was um, out of sync with the rest of the genome sequencing program, we bridged some of the groups to get them all synchronized to have this workshop to make a decision about going forward or not going forward, or if we go forward, at what scale, with what priorities, what objectives, and so forth. So it's not that all these discussions aren't coming, we, it's all being orchestrated and correct. Um, the problem, of course, is, you know, in some ways what makes it hard is that we can't just stop everything for six months and do a complete, you know, resync of everything. All these things have to come because they have a life cycle. And, um, and we have to juggle decisions, you know, sometimes out of sync where we may want to have bigger picture discussion. We just can't do that. So we have to sort of do our best as we go. But it'll be a very um, important fall for the very things that you just spoke about, Val. Okay, thank you. That was very useful.